right, settle down now, pipe down. Oh, that's, that was so great. You guys were talking amongst yourselves, and that's just a great way, I think, to get the, the brain juices flowing. So, um, hi, my name is Paul Ward. I'm the worship pastor here. Before I go any further, a really quick announcement that Riley Forrest, the reason I was singing, the reason I was singing for Riley uh, this morning is he and Nikki just had their baby two days ago. Yes. Woo. So, so fun. Uh, the baby daughter, Ariella, and they're all doing great, but just keep them in your prayers. They're going to be very sleep deprived. Yes, they are but it's all good. Now, normally I'd be standing here with a guitar and, or at the piano and leading worship, but today I'm rocking the bistro table, the iPad, the coffee. Of course, the coffee. I'm not doing that because I'm trying to be all hipster or anything like that. It's simply who I am and what I'm comfortable with. If you've known me for any amount of time, you know that I always have coffee in my hand. And um, even when I drive, it has to be a ceramic mug. That's why I'm always spilling coffee on myself all the time. And I'm kind of known around here for the guy who leaves his coffee mug all around the church. So if you find a coffee mug, 50-50 chance it's mine. Once my admin assistant, Jackie, found like a collection of my coffee mugs, and she took a picture, pictures of them in their various states, and we ended up with this picture here that she, she put on my Facebook. Isn't that mean? Uh, she calls it her worship pastor's mugshot. Good, you guys are lively. This is awesome. Keep it up. Keep it up. I like it. So sorry, that was a little bit gross. We can uh, turn that off now. Also going to be using a, this whiteboard today. So um, when I go over here, We'll put it on the side screens so you guys can all see it in the room. And uh, online viewers, hopefully you can see it as well. I'll try to write nice and big. So just for warm-up and quick practice, we'll just do this drill really quick. And can you see that okay? Can you see that okay? Good. All right, anyone know the answer? Four and negative four. Plus or minus four. I used to be a high school math teacher a long time ago. So that's why I did that. But this is not math class. This is church. And for those of you who hate math, I don't want to like trigger anything weird. So we'll erase that. What I will put up here is some key words that we'll want to keep in mind as we're uh, discussing together. And so we are in the middle of a sermon series called Faithfulness. So just to give you that context. And uh, this morning, we're going to discuss the life of Jacob. And then if you want to go ahead and turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 32. And our main text this morning will be verses 22 through 32. So faithfulness is our overarching series, Jacob, Genesis 32, 22 to 32. And I did not put my Bible here. That is so funny. And I erased it from here, but I'm going to look it up on this one. That'll work, right? Because I got my e-Bible right here. And let's hope it comes up here. Forgive me, I'm so sorry. Genesis is pretty easy to find, first book of the Bible, right? Okay, here we go, 32. All right, so this is the passage where Jacob wrestles with God. That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons. He crossed the ford of the Jabbok. And after he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions so Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip, so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? 
Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask me my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, It is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip, because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. Let's pray together. Let's bow our heads and, and pray, and God... Would you please speak through your word? Holy Spirit, just move in this place as we've been responding in worship to you, as we take a deep look at the life of Jacob. God, will you show us what we can learn about our lives by looking at his life? And God, would you just bring transformation into this place this morning? We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty. Well, Jacob was born around 1800 BC, and so that was about 4,000 years ago. His father Isaac and his grandfather Abraham, you might have heard of these characters in Genesis, two very important people, because God chose this specific lineage to create a brand new holy nation, a nation that even exists today, and that nation is called Israel. Good job, you're awake. Good job. Now, this context, the family drama that's going on here, especially during Jacob's life, is very intense. Have any of you ever experienced any family drama at all, ever? Any hands? Probably every hand, right? I think all of us have experienced some family drama. But isn't it amazing how God can take up something that, take that, something that seems so messed up and create a nation out of that and just reclaim that and use that? Have hope if you've ever felt like it's just too messed up for God to do any good. Because he can. Now, in Genesis, there's some unhealthy competition going on within this family situation. Anybody relate to that at all, competition? And there are three types of competition. So just write it here. And they each start with the letter B. So the first competition going on is over birthright, okay? The second competition going on, and this is kind of a weird one, But the second one is over babies. I'll explain that one in a little bit. And then the third competition is over a blessing, which might sound kind of weird, but we'll explain that as well. An unhealthy competitive attitude going on all around this family over birthright, babies, and blessing. And the first one, birthright, you might know the story, but it's Jacob versus, anybody know? Esau. Jacob versus Esau. This is really, really wild. Uh, Look with me, if you go back a few chapters to Genesis 25, Jacob was competitive at the very, like literally the very beginning of his life. Uh, Genesis 25, verse 19, starting there, says, This is the account of the family line of Abraham's son Isaac. Isaac became the father of, Abraham became the father of Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean, from Paddan Aram, and sister of Laban, the Aramean. We'll get back to Uncle Laban in a little bit. He plays a part in the story. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. The Lord answered his prayer, and his wife Rebekah became pregnant. The babies jostled each other within her. She said, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, 
There are two nations in your womb, and two peoples from within, from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red. His whole body was like a hairy garment, so they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. Can you even fathom that happening? Can you picture it? Like if you're a parent and you're there in uh, the birth center and you, you know you, you got twin boys coming out and the first one's coming out and probably full of joy and then to your shock, the second twin boy is literally coming out and like pulling um, his brother's heel as if to say, get back in here, <laughs> get back in here. Let me go first, me first, me first. Competition from the very beginning of Jacob's life. The name Jacob is explained as literally meaning the holder of the heel or the supplanter because Jacob deprived his brother Esau of his rights. Now, Riley Forrest, our associate worship pastor, he wanted me to let you guys know that his middle name is Jacob. I don't know why, because that name basically means to be a liar. <laughs> but I don't think Riley's a liar. If you're named Jacob, that's fine. Nowadays, it has a much more positive connotation to it, right? It's a pretty popular name. And um, some theories suggest that Jacob came from an ancient hypothetical name that actually means, may God protect. So as we'll see, God did indeed protect Jacob and restored many, many things in his life. Well, one of the biggest, earliest mess-ups in Jacob's life was kind of when he was coming of age, and Jacob was kind of like the mama's boy of the two twins. And he and his mom decide to hatch a plan to steal his brother Esau's birthright. Well, back then, the birthright was like the family inheritance, okay? So this is a big deal. And Jacob does it by taking advantage of his, his father Isaac's poor eyesight and basically shows up and pretends that he's Esau. And his father gives him the inheritance or the birthright where he meant to give it to Esau, but it was given to Jacob. When Esau finds out he is so incredibly angry, he wants to kill his brother. That's a big deal. It'd be like today if you were to somehow trick your parents into writing your name into the will and writing your sibling's name out of the will. That, Jacob is not a very good character. He's a cheater right now. He's kind of living out of his name, Jacob. I can relate to unhealthy competitive spirit. At an early age, I was a highly competitive runner. And it was around ages 11 to 14 especially. And there's some really good things that I learned about competition, athletic competition. Uh, I learned work ethic, you know, and discipline. Uh, learned how to be with a team and, and do good teamwork. But there were some really unhealthy things, patterns and attitudes that I developed inside through competitive running. Namely that I just I wanted to be, beat people no matter what. I just wanted to win and only first place would do. That's something that has, even bleeds over to this day. That I struggle with an unhealthy competitive spirit sometimes. When I don't need to be competitive, I need to be cooperative with people. But over the years, I've been able to let go of some of that. But uh, back then, in competitive track, sometimes the, the pressure I felt was so intense that before races, I would be crying. One of the more poignant examples of that, let me take you back to 1985, and I qualified for the Youth National Track and Field Championships in New York. And so my dad and I fly from California to New York. I qualified for the 800-meter 
final. And so 11 and 12 year old boys, 800 meter final. That's about a half mile. That's two laps around the track. I was so incredibly nervous at the start line that when the gun went off, I shot out into the lead. I ran this race out of pure fear, not like a calm confidence, out of pure fear. And now the second lap is what I'm about to show you. So check out this video. Here's the end. You can cheer, come on. <laughs> Could you hear my dad cheering at the end? <laughs> How could you miss that, right? I miss my dad. He, uh, he passed away about 12 years after that race. I miss him a lot. But uh, you know, what I remember from this race is not that I got third place in the nation. I should be thrilled by that, right? That's not what I remember about it. What I remember is how disappointed I felt in not winning. And the fact that fourth place almost nipped me at the end. And that I, I ran a really dumb race. I went out way too fast. What if? What if it, I, had, I had run a smarter race and I had paced myself? Maybe I would have won. I'm just beating myself up where I should be thrilled to get third place in the country. You know, I became a Christian when I was just five years old. I've always believed who Jesus is. But growing up, much of my self-worth in my identity was not just in Christ like it should have been, but a lot of my identity was wrapped up in how I performed, uh, how I performed athletically, and then when I got injured in high school, that just kind of shifted to how I performed academically, just out of ambition, wanting to get into the very best college that I could. Very slowly over the years, I've been able to let go of some of my performance anxiety tendencies, but not without lots and lots of spiritual wrestling. I relate to Jacob a lot. Maybe you do too. This is going to sound strange, but one of the best teachers that has helped me over the years to let go of some of this performance and competitive stuff has been depression. And I know that might sound weird, but I, I've gone through depression several times over the years. And God has actually spoken and helped me work through some really deep stuff each time that I've gone through it. Even as recently as five months ago, I did go through a small depressive episode. And five months ago, during that, it was about a one-month period of just having anxiety and depression and feeling kind of dark. Um, and I swear this is before Jesse decided that he wanted to do a, a series on faithfulness. It's before Pastor Jesse asked me to preach. But I remember five months ago, that God just kept telling me over and over again. And it came up in my prayer journal a lot. Simply be faithful. Just the word faithful uh, kept coming to my heart again and again. The scriptures that he showed me, uh, what God was just speaking to my heart. That really helped a lot. Because being faithful, I think, really um, combats that competitive spirit, because anyone can just choose to be faithful to God and do the next right thing. That helped me quite a bit. You see, I don't care anymore what people think of me as a runner and what place I get in a running race, but I do t tend to care a lot about how people view me as a leader and what I'm doing here up front. And when the leadership pressure gets more and more intense, and it's usually my, my own perceived pressure on myself, then I, I tend to internalize it. 
Depression has been a tool to remind me that I'm vulnerable in this area. I can't let my thoughts just go to worrying about performance, past performance or future performance, or I suffer emotionally. By focusing simply on being faithful, it takes the unhealthy pressure off. So what I'm going to do here now is flip this around. I'll try not to hit the piano, see how this goes. All right, awesome. And I'm going to draw a graph up here. I know it's my math teacher tendencies again. But uh, this is something that one of my counselors showed me, I think, some years ago. And um, it's helped me quite a bit. Maybe it'll help you as well. But if we make a graph, and here we, we put anxiety, uh, and it's an anxiety versus performance graph. For most people, their graph would tend to look something like this. Something like that. Now, not all anxiety is bad. Uh, in fact, anxiety, we all, the, the reality is, we all feel some anxiety every single day, right? 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 Um, anxiety is energy. Um, we all need some motivation, accountability. And for most of us, a certain amount of stress or anxiety, our performance goes up. And this is all kind of the healthy performance area. You know, and performance can be thought of just how you function. It could be cognitive function. But kind of like a weightlifter, a weightlifter can put on more and more weight and kind of put stress on the muscles and build up the muscles. At, at a certain point, if it's too much weight, even the strongest person in the world, that weight is going to fall back on them, right? And at some point, too much anxiety and performance goes down. Here is depression. Here is breakdown, right? Anybody relating to this at all? Do I have any type A personalities out there? Anybody? Okay, I am. So my graph, my graph looks like a little different shape, especially during a time of depression. My graph tends to look like, more like this. <laughs> So what's going on here? Well, I'm a type A. Um, I do perform and function pretty well with, with some amount of pressure. In fact, I thrive for a while. But my, it's kind of a thin line up here for me. And after a certain point of a certain amount of stress, I tend to go down pretty quick. It's just a reality and something that I need to be aware of and maybe thinking about what shape you might have, maybe that helps. Now, what I found out most recently is simply by focusing on being faithful, I can round out the shape of my graph simply by focusing on doing the, the next right thing and just being faithful to God. So maybe that helps a little bit. So keep that in mind. Uh, all right, now I'm going to flip the board again. Bless you. And we're going to move on to the second competition, uh, which is babies. And what's happening here, uh, the context is uh, Jacob has just stolen his brother Esau's birthright. Uh, so Esau is out to get him. Esau is mad, wants to kill him. And so Jacob flees and moves to a pretty faraway land. And Jacob moves in with his uncle, Laban, and falls in love with one of Laban's daughters, Rachel, which is a little bit funky because that's like his first cousin, right? Uh, some inbreeding going on there. But this is what happens. And so Jacob asked Laban, can I marry Rachel? Laban says, if you work for me for seven years, you can marry my, my daughter, Rachel. So Jacob does that. And uh, seven years later, we get to the wedding. And I assume that it was a pretty awesome wedding ceremony. And they had their first night of the honeymoon. And then Jacob wakes up the next morning. He looks over. 
he realizes, you're not Rachel. You're Rachel's sister, Leah. Now, how in the world that could ever happen, I have no idea. How is that going to happen? Like it was really dark or something the night before. He just didn't see who he's marrying. So really odd. But he marries Rachel's sister, Leah. Goes back to Uncle Laban. Like, you tricked me. What's going on here? Laban said, well, Leah is my firstborn daughter, so really needed to marry her. So that's why I did that. But you can marry Rachel as well if you work for me another seven years. So Jacob says, all right, all right, we'll do that. So Jacob marries Rachel as well. So he's married to his two first cousins, who are sisters, of course. And the baby's competition begins. It's Leah versus Rachel, folks. Here's what happens. Now, Jacob really loves Rachel, but he's got these two wives and but Leah is able to get pregnant really fast, and Leah pumps out four sons. Boom. All right, there we go. Rachel has infertility issues, not able to conceive as easily. So Rachel gets this awesome idea. Rachel says, well, Jacob, why don't you take my maidservant, Billa, and sleep with her and have babies through her for me? Because she's jealous of her sister, Leah. And Jacob says, okay. Okay, I'll do that. And so he does, and Billah gives him two sons. Uh, Leah looks at that and is like feeling threatened by that. So Leah now says, well, Jacob, why don't you take my maidservant, Zilpah, and sleep with her and have more babies with her? Jacob says, okay. So he does, and Zilpah bears him two sons. So what's the score right now? I got six babies to two babies. Leah's in a commanding lead. All right. And you'd think that these sisters would knock it off, finally, because this is ridiculous, but they don't. And Leah has two more sons and a daughter. So I'll use a different color for the daughter. Okay. And then finally, near the end of her life, Rachel is able to get pregnant. Out comes Joseph. And then Rachel dies during childbirth, but gives birth to Benjamin, who survives. Benjamin is Jacob's youngest son. Isn't that family drama at its finest? I was just blown away when I, like, really mapped that out and saw what was happening. It's like the most warped, unhealthy competition you could ever have. Imagine living in that type of household. What a mess! But God still uses this to do something so special. Count the number of blues. How many are there? There are 12 sons. You know what they become? They become the 12 tribes of Israel, a new nation. Unbelievable how God works. Uh, In your bulletin, there are some notes if you want to fill in a couple blanks. Our first principle is this. Our first principle, God calls you to a mission to be faithful to even when you have a rough start. You all think Jacob had a fairly rough start? Oh, yes, he sure did. And the first two types of competition were really unhealthy. The third type of competition that we're going to talk about now ended up being a more healthy competition, and that's over blessing. And this time... It's Jacob versus God. Seems maybe a little bit unfair, right? But that's what it is, Jacob versus God. Let's unpack the scripture that we read together at the beginning, Genesis chapter 32, starting verses 22. At this point in the story, Jacob is really um, got his back against the wall. Jacob is in between a rock and a hard place. Uh, He's moved his whole family and possessions out of his uncle Laban's house, and he's heading south, but Laban doesn't like that and wants him to, like, move back in with him. So Laban is in hot pursuit of Jacob and his household, 
And then Jacob finds out that his brother Esau, after all these years, is also in hot pursuit of him. He doesn't know if Esau wants to kill him in his entire household or what is going on. And so Jacob is at the ford of the Jabbok River, and he sends his household and possessions across the stream. And on one side, he's got Laban. The other side, he's got Esau coming, and he's got a night alone to himself. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt stuck in that way? You're trying to be faithful to what God has called you to do, but you've got pressure on all sides. You've got enemies on all sides. You know, you just feel stuck, like it's a lose-lose kind of situation. That's exactly where Jacob was. So what does Jacob do? He wrestles. He wrestles with what's described in Scripture as a man. Now, this wrestler was thought to have been an angel or a special appearance of Jesus Christ before his incarnation 2,000 years later. Either way, um, Jacob is wrestling more than just at a physical level, right? Jacob is wrestling at a soul, spiritual level. It's like the psalmist in Psalm 42 who says, Why so downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? It's a wrestling within himself and God just as much as it is a physical match. And then what's going on in verse 26? At that point, Jacob holding on but says to the man, you know, I'm not going to let you go unless you bless me. What's going on there? According to his past, Jacob was always clever enough and sneaky enough. He never felt like he just needed to rely and trust on God alone. But at this point, after an all-night wrestling match, he could only rely on the blessing of God alone. Jacob was reduced to this place where he could just, all he could do was hold on. Um, It's like in a boxing match. Uh, We see boxers going at it. Maybe they get to the 10th round, right? They're both so exhausted, they're trying to throw punches at each other. But sometimes you see the the two boxers just hold on to each other. You ever seen that? That's what's going on here. But that's not a bad place to be. God is actually answering Jacob's prayer from a little bit earlier in this chapter when Jacob found himself alone between a rock and a hard place, Jacob prayed to God, oh God, deliver me from my enemies. You know, he was, Jacob was thinking of Esau, his brother, and to deliver me from my enemies. God was answering that prayer, but before God could deliver Jacob from his enemies, he had to be delivered from his own self-will and his own self-reliance. Jacob thought the real enemy was outside himself, but the enemy was actually his own fleshly nature. That needed to be conquered by God first. Jacob went through such a transformation that night that God even changed his name. Live now Jacob for so many years, which has connotations of kind of being a cheater. Now God said, I'm giving you a new name. That new name is Israel. And do you know what the name Israel means? God rules. What an awesome transformation. God rules. Going from someone who's a cheater and a liar to God rules. Jacob's finally surrendering his life to God. What a great name for a guy and a great name for a new nation, right? God is speaking that new identity in there. In my life, I've experienced transformations like this. Uh, Over eight years ago, I went through a recovery from alcohol addiction, and I remember in the early days of recovery that God woke me up one night, and God showed me a scripture. It was from Psalm 36, verse 9, which says, for with you is the fountain of life. In light, you will see the light. And God was also, he spoke to me a new name that night. 
he said to me, Paul, I want you to be my son of light. I want you to be my son of light. What God was speaking to me, this new identity, is calling me out of the deception that I was living in and calling me into a life where I live my life with no more secrets. And also that God would use my, my limp, my spiritual limp, my character flaws, my recovery from alcohol and depression to be a light to others. And God has done that. God has been doing that. And I'm very, very, very grateful. What about you? In what ways have you seen God develop your identity? Sometimes it's subtle. Sometimes it's like a whack to the head, okay? Like Jacob, like it's been in my life from time to time. But what does recovery look like for you? It could be uh, from all different types of things, from pornography to chemical addiction to mood disorder like mine, physical pain, abuse, something traumatic. Whatever it is, God wants to use your area of struggle to be a light to others. He really does. He really does. I was talking to a friend of mine just the other week who shared a little bit about how she was abused as a child. But the past 15 years, she has been working uh, with victims of domestic violence and working with their families and just helping restore families through, through a lot of hurt. It is so inspiring to see people um, recover from a hurt like that and allow God to speak that new identity and that they live from in a new mission. Our second principle is this. You may have a physical, emotional, or spiritual limp, but your weakness can be used by God to be a light to others. Amen? That would be a good place for an amen. Thank you. All right. One more diagram. You guys up for one more diagram? All right, this is working okay? Let me erase this really quick. Sorry, don't want a lot of dead time. Okay. So uh, this is something that I actually learned several months ago when my life group went through a marriage series by Francis Chan called Mar Marriage in the Light of Eternity. And so if I'm going to put here a timeline, it's like the life, life and afterlife timeline. And so life begins here with birth, no duh, baby Ariella, right, is on her second day, so she's right there at the start line. And then here is the point of, of death, not to get all morbid on you. And then here, you put your, if you put your trust in Jesus Christ, eternity in heaven is the afterlife. Now, for most people, uh, your life, maybe on average, would be, what, maybe 80, 80 years? This is what blows me away. It just boggles the mind to start to think of eternity, what number is that? It's at least, let's just measure it, at least in billions, right? And we start really thinking about that perspective. What are we working for during the 80? So often, I think, and I, I'm guilty of this as well, I'm focused on maybe the last 10 is going to be retirement, right? Right? So I think for most of us, the tendency is to spend the first 70 years uh, just working, 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 saving money for... Now, there's nothing against saving money for retirement. That is really important. But I'm just saying, when you look at this whole life and afterlife timeline, the perspective there is kind of crazy, kind of mixed up, I think, often, that we're working so hard for these 10, shouldn't we be preparing for the billions of years to come. And uh, I love this quote by Francis Chan. We'll put it up on the screen, also online for you. Francis Chan, wonderful Christian author, 
says, people accuse me of going overboard and preparing for my first 10 million years in eternity. In my opinion, people go overboard in worrying about their last 10 years on earth. And then let's look at the very end of Jacob's life because so many things are restored and he's proven to be one of the, one of the faithful heroes in Scripture. If you go to the New Testament and you find Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11, in verse 21, it says, By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each, each of Joseph's sons and worshipped as he leaned on top of his staff. So despite all that family drama that Jacob brought upon himself and endured, in the very end, Jacob was proven to be faithful. And it's a beautiful picture of what it was like for Jacob at that moment, kind of on his deathbed, where he's surrounded by family, and he's able to bless his sons and grandsons. Those 12 sons became the 12 tribes of Israel. Just an amazing story. And helps me think about my life, hopefully yours as well. What do you hope the very end of your life is going to look like? What do you hope it's going to be like right here? I hope, my prayer, is that I just be, I be with my closest family members, and I, I don't, I don't need to hear, you are the best ever. You succeeded in all these things you did. You the man. What I really just want to hear was, Paul, you were faithful. Didn't come without quite a few mess-ups. <laughs> but in the end, I just hope my family would say, Paul, you were faithful. You were faithful to God his calling on your life. You are faithful to your wife. You are faithful to your family. I don't know about you, but that's what I hope to hear. I don't think anything else really matters much, to be honest. And then how about that moment when we go from the very end of life and you step into eternity. As I come into the Lord's presence, the very first thing that I hope to hear from God may it be your prayer as well, is simply, well done, good and faithful servant. You see, our third principle is this. What matters at the end of your life is not your performance or lack of performance, but simply staying faithful to God. So I hope that this perspective is rubbing off on you today a little bit or a lot. What we have here is a picture of God's faithfulness sharpening and shaping our faithfulness. Faithfulness is all about just staying true to your character. How has God demonstrated his own faithfulness the most? Think about that for a sec. How has God been faithful to himself the most? I would say it was by sending his only son, Jesus Christ, to come here to earth, to die for my sins and your sins, and to make a way that we can be with God in eternity. That's how God has been most faithful to himself. And then the story of Jacob is connected to Jesus. Because we start with Abraham, then we go to Isaac, then we go to Jacob. One of Jacob's sons, Judah, began a, a new branch of the lineage. If you follow Judah, several hundred years later, we have King David, king of Israel, right? Several hundred years later, we have King Hezekiah, another good king. And then several hundred years, about 600 years after Hezekiah, a man named Joseph, who married Mary, who conceived of the Holy Spirit, who gave birth to Jesus. You see, Jesus is the central part of God's plan that began with a very dysfunctional family 
with Jacob and ended up with a holy nation and eventually the birth of Jesus. Jesus is our most faithful hero in all of Scripture. Jesus is the perfect culmination of God being faithful to himself and all of his promises. How many people do you know who would sacrifice their only son for others? Not a whole lot of people that I know. God is so faithful, you guys. Our take home is this. God's faithfulness is constant, but our faithfulness develops through a process of refinement. So I'm going to invite the worship team to come on up now. And uh, they're just going to move this little whiteboard to the side, so don't look at them. And also the prayer team. I'm going to invite the prayer team. Uh, They'll be over here at the prayer station to your left. I want to really invite you this morning to take this time as we have a worship response and a prayer response. If you have a need, something you'd like to pray for, it could be anything, please pray with the prayer team during this time of singing and or stay after the service and pray with them. And especially if you are kind of wrestling with your identity, if you feel like God um, just speaking something new to you and you just like someone to pray for, or it could be something you need to step into recovery from today. Uh, please pray with one of our prayer team members. Or if you're realizing for the first time today that Jesus is the way and the truth of the life and the life, and he died for your sins, you're a sinner, but you believe in Jesus that died on the cross for your sins, and he rose again, and he's conquered death and you want to put your trust in Jesus for the first time, just come over and and pray with one of our, our prayer team members. Let's go ahead and pray together as well. God, please just move in whatever new faithful identity you have for each of us today. Shower us, God, with your grace and your hope. God, that we are never too far gone to be used powerfully by you. But it's not about us, God. It's all about you and you're a faithful God. That we can even live this life and have opportunity to be with you in the afterlife of heaven. God, move us now to respond and worship to your love, which is so present here today. I'm praying in Jesus' name. Amen.